In this video we're going to talk about some of the properties of alkanes and how the shapes of those molecules and the conformations of those molecules affect their properties and reactivity. So when we take a look at the linear alkanes we've talked about uh, the fact that they are uh, different sizes because they have different numbers of carbons and hydrogens. However, you'll notice that um, the boiling points, one of the physical properties of these alkanes, do change depending on the size of those structures. Uh, but it's not just about the size, it's also about the shape. Um, as you know, there's some attractive forces between these nonpolar hydrocarbons that we call van der Waals attractions. So the longer they are, the more attractive forces there are between molecules. Um, and also, the more linear they are, the more those attractive forces are available. If you take a look at the isomers for pentane, uh, pentane, 2-methylbutane, and 2,2-dimethylpropane, this is increasing branching of the molecule. They're exactly the same mass, the same number of carbons and hydrogens, however their boiling points are very different. You'll notice that the linear pentane is the highest boiling point. If you have one branch, the boiling point drops from 36 degrees to 28 degrees, and if you have that uh, more compact shaped molecule and it's more highly branched, the boiling point drops to 10 degrees Celsius. This has to do with diminishing the amounts of van der Waals attractions or how the molecules uh, fit with each other. So the shape of the molecule and the conformations of the molecule can really affect its properties. The other thing about alkanes is that their reactivity is very low for most chemical reactions. However, one of the main reactions they do do is combustion or oxidation. So for example, if you take methane and that reacts with oxygen, it produces carbon dioxide and water and heat also because the energy released when you change the bonds from carbon hydrogen bonds to carbon oxygen bonds releases heat. We refer to this as the heat of combustion. That is when we burn or combust an alkane we can measure the heat that's released and this is a property of how much energy the molecule contains or the potential energy before we burn it. So if we take a closer look at this reaction, methane plus oxygen, actually two moles of oxygen will react with one mole of methane to produce carbon dioxide, two molecules of water, and that will release 890 kilojoules per mole of energy, the delta H or the enthalpy change. This is a reflection of how much energy methane possessed relative to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a more stable or lower energy product. Methane is a higher energy or less stable material. Now this is all fine and well, but we can actually use this experiment, this heat of combustion that we can measure by burning completely a hydrocarbon and compare them with each other. So take a look at uh, methane versus 2-methylbutane. You can see 2-methylbutane has more carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds and it consumes more oxygen when it burns fully or combusts fully to produce 5 moles of carbon dioxide and 6 moles of water. The energy released is going to be much greater. You can see it's downhill in energy of about 3,500 kilojoules per mole compared to methane which makes sense because there are more carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds being broken apart and releasing their energy. That's comparing apples and oranges, CH4 versus C5H12. That's going to be quite different in terms of the energy contained in the molecule. Where this becomes useful is when we start to compare molecules that are isomers of each other. So if you take a look at octane and then three of its other isomers of octane, 2-methylheptane, 2-2-dimethylhexane, and 2233-tetramethylbutane. These all have the same molecular formula, they have the same mass. However, if we burn them in air, we see that the energy released for each of these isomers is different. The more branched molecules are lower in energy or more stable because they've released less energy, they contained less energy when they were intact. When we burn them, we can see how much energy is released and then do a direct comparison to see that the linear alkanes are actually higher in energy or less stable than more branched alkanes. So there's another property that's different about the shape and size and conformations of molecules. Okay, I've been using this word conformation and it's important to understand what that means. If you take molecules that have all single bonds and look at them at room temperature, all of those bonds are rotating extremely rapidly. So no, no bond is, is uh, fixed in space unless it's at absolute zero. Of course, frozen molecules at absolute zero is not possible to obtain. There's always some kind of molecular motions, in particular uh, bond rotations. 
So if things are connected just by single bonds or sigma bonds, they freely rotate, and there's other things which might affect the barrier of rotation, but they generally at room temperature, they're rotating very fast. So linear alkanes are always in motion. They're constantly in motion. When we want to analyze the shape and structure of a molecule, what we can do is take a look at one specific frozen conformation. When we use this word conformer to talk about the different rotational isomers or conformations or shapes that the molecule can adopt throughout all of its motions. And again, we're, what we're looking at is a conformational analysis or looking at a specific frozen conformation of a molecule and comparing it then with other conformations or other molecules. Now in order to represent three-dimensional molecules on a two-dimensional plane, uh, it's important to have good systems set up so that you can express the three-dimensionality of a molecule. And one of the ways in which we draw molecules to represent three dimensions is to use what we refer to as a sawhorse projection. A sawhorse projection of a molecule uh, uses wedges and dashes to indicate which bonds are coming out or going away from us relative to the plane of the paper. If it's just a single line, it's shown as being in the plane of the paper. So let me give you an example. Let's take the ethane molecule. Ethane is CH3, CH3, so it's a two carbons attached to three hydrogens. Now I can draw it like this, but that doesn't indicate any of the three-dimensionality of this molecule. As we know, each of these carbons are sp3 hybridized and tetrahedral. So we need to be able to represent that and the, all of the bonds in three dimensions. So if you take a look at drawing uh, the carbon and carbon bond in the plane of the paper and then draw one of the hydrogens on each of the carbons in the plane of the paper. Always we represent a tetrahedral easiest by showing two of the bonds in the plane of the paper. So for each of these carbons I have shown two bonds in the plane of the paper. To form the tetrahedron one of them must come out of the paper towards you and we use a bold wedged line to sh indicate that so that that hydrogen is coming towards us out of the plane of the paper and the third hydrogen is going back away from us into the past the plane of the paper so that represents the tetrahedral which we can which we could see with set with the this carbon as the center we can see that there's a tetrahedral that's set up like that it, that hopefully gives you a little bit better picture of the three-dimensionality of that carbon on the left. Now we also have to do that with, this, with the carbon on the right. So let me uh, draw in the wedges and dashes for that carbon. So in this carbon, it's going to be a tetrahedron in this direction. That hydrogen comes out towards us, and that hydrogen goes away from this. So this looks like a sawhorse, if you will, hence the name a sawhorse projection. Okay, so that's one frozen conformation of an ethane molecule. If you imagine this carbon-carbon bond in the middle, this single bond uh, allowing each of the carbons to rotate, this is freely rotating very fast. And I've just shown one frozen picture of that. So if we, if we keep the, the carbon on the left frozen and we rotate the carbon on the right 180 degrees, what would that look like in terms of our sawhorse projection? So a 180 degree rotation. Again, I want, I want to keep the carbon on the left the same, so I'm going to draw it exactly the same with the hydrogen down here coming out towards us and the hydrogen here going out away from us and the carbon-carbon bond. So if I rotate this carbon on the right 180 degrees, it means that the bond that's in the plane of the board, instead of pointing t up, is now pointing down. Okay. And then the hydrogen that was here in the back rotates around and all the way to the top and is now coming out towards us. And the hydrogen that was here in the front rotates around 180 degrees and is pointed away from us. So it looks like that. Notice um, our sawhorse has changed a little bit. And we can better represent it like that. So uh, this gives you an idea about the three-dimensionality and what happens when you rotate a bond. Another way, which is probably a little bit easier to analyze the relationship between the groups on both of those carbons, is to draw a Newman projection. 
And so I'm going to draw the sawhorse projection one more time just to clarify uh, what we've drawn. So let me draw the two different conformations of the sawhorse projection that I had before. The one on the left, notice we have both of the hydrogens on the bottom coming out towards us and going away on each of the carbons. And then the 180 degree rotation where this one was in the plane of the board the left carbon is the same the right carbon has rotated 180 degrees one coming out and one going to the back another way to view this in a little bit better perspective is to visualize your eyeball being right here looking down the plane of the bond so you have one carbon which is closer to you and one carbon which is further away Okay, so if you imagine um, looking at this where the carbon closest to you is, is uh, right on top of the carbon that's further from you, what would that look like to you if you projected that flat on the paper? Well, I'm going to represent that carbon closest to us as just a circle. And that represents this carbon right here. If you look at this carbon, all three of the hydrogens are coming towards you, but if I'm going to project it flat on the plane, what would it look like from your eyeball perspective? Well, uh, the hydrogen on the top would look like it's going straight up, okay? And then to the left of you will be the hydrogen that's the bold line on the sawhorse projection, and to the right of you will be the hydrogen going to the back on the sawhorse projection. So that front carbon looks like this. I've drawn it here in blue. Notice the lines that I've drawn for that carbon uh, and hydrogen bonds go through the circle that I've drawn for this Newman projection and meet in the middle. So that represents the carbon which is closest to you. Imagine, if you will, the carbon that's in the back further away from you. From your perspective here, that carbon is behind this one, so I'm not going to draw a circle, but what I can do is represent those bonds, and I'm going to draw it in red. So the hydrogen, which is in the plane of the board, from my perspective, is going to also point straight up in the air. I'm just going to put it just a little off sides, but those are overlapping from the front to the back. And notice, I don't draw the bond through the line of the circle because it's attached to the carbon behind, okay, from our perspective. And then if I look at the carbon from my perspective and I look at this hydrogen that's going away from us, it will be down to the right, so it'll be right here. Hydrogen closer to us will be down to the left from our perspective and will be right there. So you notice we have a picture now viewing along the carbon-carbon bond where the carbon closest to us is right on top of the carbon further away from us. And we can see the relationship of the carbon-hydrogen bonds, which I've drawn in blue on the closer carbon and red on the further carbon. Well, what if we do the same thing for the other sawhorse that I have over here? So again, take our eyeball and look down this bond. We have a representation, Newman projection, where we can draw the circle. And first I'm going to draw the ones in the back because this back carbon that's further from us is in exactly the same position as the, the one on the left. So nothing changes here. So from our perspective, this hydrogen in the plane of the board on the sawhorse becomes the hydrogen straight up in the back. Notice I didn't draw the line through the, through the circle, but stopping at the circle. And then we have another hydrogen to the left and another hydrogen to the right. So I'll draw those here. Okay, so that's the back carbon I've written in red. What about the front carbon? Well, the front carbon here, if we're looking at this perspective, now it's rotated 180 degrees. So imagine, if you will, taking these hydrogens and rotating 180 degrees. What happens? Well, this one that was originally on top now becomes straight down. Okay. And the other ones will rotate also 180 degrees. And so what we have is a conformation which looks like this. Notice that looks different than the one we had before. The bonds are now staggered from each other, comparing the front CH bonds to the back CH bonds. And if you look at that angle, it's about 60 degrees, dihedral angle, from the front carbon hydrogen to the back carbon hydrogen. 
And then from our perspective, from our Newman projection, we have between the bonds of the same carbon, these are all 120 degrees. Okay, so that's a Newman projection, which gives us a perspective now to be able to compare on a two-dimensional surface what the front or closer bonds look like as compared to their positions relative to the back bonds. I want to talk about a few other terms because I, w let's take a look at these two conformations again uh, where I have the bonds in the front and the back um, lined up with each other and ones where they're 60 degrees apart. We use the term staggered to refer to that situation where the bonds are 60 degrees apart, where you have them as far apart as possible between the front and the back bonds, and that is a staggered conformation. When the bonds in the front line up exactly with the bonds in the back and the dihedral angle between them is zero degrees, we refer to that as an eclipsed conformation. Now we do know that since this is freely rotating very rapidly uh, that you can have of course an infinite number of positions or conformations between that but when we're analyzing sh structures and shapes of molecules we can look at these frozen positions and compare their energies and do things like that to talk about how that affects properties of the molecule. We see when we look at these two different conformations, this eclipsed conformation where the bonds are closer to each other and the staggered conformation where the front and back bonds are as far apart from each other, we know that the energies of those molecules are different. That is, it's lower energy or more stable to have a staggered conformation than an eclipsed conformation. And that's due to two different things that uh, affect that energy of the molecule. One is what we refer to as torsional strain and that is the strain that's introduced to the molecule by the electron repulsion as the electrons in the front bonds and the back bonds come closer together because we know that like charges repel each other. So if you have two bonds that are essentially regions of electron density and they become eclipsed there's more repelling forces there. Imagine taking two magnets with like poles and trying to put them together. As you get them closer together you feel the strength of the repulsion more. Well the same thing is true when we have bonds from the front carbon to the back carbon they repel each other and so you have this torsional strain. That's higher energy and the molecule is less stable and has higher energy. Another aspect of how conformational changes affect the energy of a molecule is what we refer to as the steric strain. And that's the strain introduced when atoms are actually being forced to come close to each other. In other words, atoms or groups are bumping into each other. Let's imagine if these are CH3 groups. Those are much larger. And if you put two CH3 groups, one on the front and one on the back, close to each other, then their physical space that they occupy are starting to bump into each other. This is what we refer to as steric strain and that can make a difference in the energetics of a particular conformation of a molecule as well. So taking all this into account, let's take a look at the energy of an ethane molecule as it rotates completely 360 degrees around this carbon-carbon bond and take a look at what it does to the energy of the molecules. As those bonds from the front to the back become closer together, the energy of the molecule increases. So if we start out here at a completely staggered conformation, and you can see the sawhorse for the staggered conformation on the left, and probably an easier to view Newman projection for that staggered conformation on the right. As you rotate about 60 degrees, and I'm going to rotate the front carbon, leaving the back the same. So as you rotate this 60 degrees, those bonds now all become eclipsed. And when they're completely eclipsed, that's the highest energy point. So as we rotate 0, 20, 40, 60 degrees, the energy of the molecule is increasing. As you continue rotating, so continue rotating past that, another 60 degrees, what happens is the bonds go past eclipse and then they start getting further and further apart. So the energy decreases until you get to the completely staggered conformation again. Since all groups are the same on the front and the back, that 120 degree rotation will get you right back to the exact same position that you had at the beginning. 
And as you continue doing that for another 60 degrees to a complete 180 degree rotation, you go to an eclipse conformation, and then you lose energy, lower the energy until you get to the stagger conformation, etc., etc., until you get to a complete 360 degree rotation. What you see is that the energy of the molecule is oscillating as that rotation happens. Now the highest energy point, the eclipsed conformation when all the bonds are aligned with each other in the front and the back, those are the highest energy conformations, are the least stable conformations, whereas completely staggered are the lowest energy conformations. And we will see that if the groups are not the same on the front and the back of, the, of that carbon-carbon bond rotation we're analyzing, that those energies might not be the same. That is, the highest energy for one rotation might be higher than another. Let's take a look now at uh, a slightly larger molecule, the butane molecule. So this is four carbons, and what we're concerned with analyzing is actually the the carbon-carbon bond we're looking at between the two middle carbons. So if we take a look at that and present this, here's the sawhorse picture for the butane, uh, and present looking down this bond as a Newman projection, what we'd see is something like this over here. So from the frontmost carbon, you see two hydrogens going up, one up to the left, one up to the right, and a CH3 group going down straight. Okay, On the back carbon, from the specific conformation I drew, we have a CH3 going straight up, that's back here, and then a hydrogen down to the left, and a hydrogen down to the right from our viewpoint. Here is a better representation of the model for that structure. This is the sawhorse projection that we can see, and this illustrates how much larger the methyl group is versus the hydrogens. So here's the carbon-carbon bond, here's the hydrogens, here's the methyl, etc. Well, again, if you look at this in a Newman projection, view down that carbon-carbon bond, what you see is our Newman projection here where we have the bonds in front and the bonds going out in back. Notice the methyl group in the back is 180 degrees apart from the methyl group in the front. Well this shows you uh, that from several vantage points so you can see the picture is the space filling model on the right gives you a better perspective of the actual size that the molecules are that the groups on the molecule are taking up uh, and the conformation so if you look at this rotation there's our Newman projection and as it as I move this around to the side this is our sawhorse projection for that molecule now what happens if we take that conformation of butane and rotate it? So again, what I'm going to do is leave the back carbon alone and rotate this molecule 60 degrees in the clockwise direction. So this CH3 group will become eclipsed with that hydrogen. This hydrogen will rotate and become eclipsed with the CH3 in the back. And this hydrogen rotates to put that eclipsed with the hydrogen down to the right. And here you can see the models of that conformation. Notice in the sawhorse picture here, we have the CH3 coming out towards us, hydrogen going back, and this in the plane. Whereas this one has this hydrogen coming towards us, that in the back, and this, oops, this in the plane. So that's the eclipsed conformation. If I rotate this and look at it in this Newman projection, you see here the carbon in front with the CH3 to the left hydrogen to the right and hydrogen straight up and in the back one the, the CH3 is on the top hydrogen to the left hydrogen to the right. Let's take a look at this in the moving picture to give a better perspective of this molecule. Here you can see I'm shifting now towards the sawhorse projection here looking at it from the side and you can see the CH3 groups while they're no longer 180 degrees apart they are closer together and now we have the torsional strain from the bonds on the front eclipsing the bonds on the back. Okay, Notice the space filling model how much size that methyl group or the CH3 group that's on the carbons that we're looking at are. Okay, There's the Newman projection with everything eclipsed.
Well, starting from that point, what I want to do is rotate this again 60 degrees. So if we go, go from this eclipse confirmation, now rotate it 60 degrees, we'll put the CH3 group right about here, and this hydrogen will move down here, and this hydrogen will move down here, and what we get then is another staggered conformation where the front group's bonds are in the middle compared to the bonds in the back. Now, one thing to point out though, unlike the very first staggered conformation we analyzed, the methyl groups are coming closer together, and you can see that here in this picture. These methyl groups in the sawhorse projection and the methyl groups, particularly in this staggered position, are coming close together. So that's creating steric strain. So it's, it does increase the energy, so it's it's higher in energy or less stable than if this methyl group were down 180 degrees. As a matter of fact, it's about 0 0.9 kilocalories per mole higher in energy than the one that was staggered with the two methyl groups 180 degrees apart. Here you can see the moving models for these. This is approaching the sawhorse view of the molecule and you can see how close those methyl groups are in bumping into each other and as you go to the more eclipsed view or the sorry the Newman projection view as it rotates to the left here you can see that uh, the methyl groups are about 60 degrees apart there's no torsional strain or the minimum torsional strain but we're starting to get steric strain in this molecule Let's continue our rotation. One more 60 degree rotation now puts the bonds eclipsed again and in this case now it's the highest energy eclipse confirmation because both of those CH3 groups are right next to each other. You can see here in the side view how much uh, that is bumping into each other and if we look at the Newman projection view from the front carbon to the back carbon those CH3 groups are right on top of each other. This is significantly higher in energy than the other conformations. So 4.5 kilocalories per mole higher in energy than the completely staggered uh, conformation where the CH3 groups were 180 degrees apart from the front to the back. Now by the way we refer to this 180 degree apart as the anti-configuration as opposed to a what we refer to as a gauche Gauss confirmation here, an eclipsed confirmation here. So here's the sin eclipse, that is sin meaning they're right next to each other. Side view, you can see how much more crowded that is and so the higher energy of this molecule is due to all of that steric strain plus the torsional strain now of the bonds being eclipsed and getting the electron-electron repulsion. So significantly higher in energy. And actually, this is the highest energy confirmation of butane that there is. Well, this picture puts it all together, all of the rotations of this molecule through 360 degrees, analyzing the energy of the molecule. And again, we're looking specifically at the rotation between carbons 2 and carbons 3 in the middle of the molecule. I've drawn all of the Newman projections for each 60 degree rotation here, and we can compare that to the energetics of the molecule on this energy diagram. So the completely staggered bonds, CH3 as far apart as possible, that's the lowest energy possible conformation for butane. And we refer to this as the staggered anti because the methyl groups are 180 degrees apart, they're anti to each other. The staggered anti conformation. As this rotates, the CH3 group moves here and now the bonds align so we increase torsional strain from the bonds to the back and the bonds to the front and we also are starting to bring the CH3 groups closer together but they're not right on top of each other so as we rotate for the first 60 degrees the energy increases until we reach some maximum as that rotates further it starts to decrease the torsional strain so the energy of the molecule goes down we reach a situation where it's the bonds are 60 degrees apart. However, it doesn't go all the way back down to our starting point. It's higher in energy at the most staggered position because the CH3 groups are coming closer together. So there's still some steric strain there. So it doesn't go all the way back down to where we started. Then as we continue rotating, now the CH3 groups 
overlap with each other. As I said, that's the highest energy point. And then, as we continue rotating, it's essentially the reverse of that. We get back to a, uh, oh, I apologize, this is a typo. If I am continue rotating this way, this CH3 group is over here. Okay, so 60 degrees apart. Uh, and as I continue rotating, this CH3 moves down here in the eclipsed. And then back to where we started, the anti-staggered which is right down here. Again, um, there are some terms that we, we talk about. Staggered and eclipsed refers to the positions of the bonds from front to back. So staggered, they're 60 degrees apart. And eclipsed, they're on top of each other, zero degrees apart everywhere. The term anti refers to two groups on the front and the back which are 180 degrees apart. If they are staggered but closer to each other, we use the term gauche to refer to that position. So this one is gauche, uh, sorry, hydrogen and CH3. So this, um, and this one is hydrogen and CH3. So this is also a gauche uh, uh, orientation of those methyl groups and all the way back to anti. Well, when we look at larger alkanes, of course, there's more than just one bond or two bonds that we're looking at rotating. The whole molecule, each of the single bonds in the molecule are all freely rotating. So actually, there's many different conformations available. If I rotate this bond, for example, we can change the, the shape and structure of the molecule. If I were to rotate that bond, it would, it would swing this around, for example, or swing this around if that bond rotates. Um, and so you can have a flexible sort of floppy alkane and as the chains become larger and larger, longer and longer, you have more and more different conformations available to the molecule and all of those have very different and you can analyze the differences in energies. It's a, a bit complicated to do all that. Fortunately we have computer programs which can calculate average energies for molecules taking into account all of the particular conformations. But being able to analyze the energetics of small molecule conformations helps us a lot when we're talking about reactivity later. So we should be able to look at ethane, propane, butane, uh, maybe some substituted butanes and look at their conformations and see what the energetic differences are.